Good morning. What a pleasure we have to have God's word in our possession, to be able to come before him and uh, hear from him. We know that when we are studying his word and we're reading his word, that we are hearing from God himself. And so uh, what a pleasure to open up his word. And let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, as we read the passage that... uh, we will look at today the gospel, gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I'll be reading out of the ESV, but feel free to follow along in the version you have. He says in verse 35, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling, but he was in the the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We've heard from the Lord in his word. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for this morning, this opportunity in your church, to come before you, to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for already what we have been reminded of through song, through testimony, that you are a great God, that you are a loving God, that you are a God who is Lord over the storm. And so we pray now, Lord, as we consider your word that has been read, that, Lord, we might be challenged and encouraged that we might uh, be reminded of who you are. That we might be asking the right questions in the midst of trials, in the midst of storms, and not be set and sidetracked with wrong questions. Oh Lord, if there's anyone here this morning especially who is hurting, who is broken, who is wondering if you've abandoned them or if you have ceased to become the almighty, glorious, gracious God that you are, that you would even this morning reinstill their faith in who you are and what you have done. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know who you are, they've been perhaps, Lord, uh, banking on their own merit to see you one day, that they might be reminded that there is only way that we can approach the Father through the Son through faith and trust in the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, may you be glorified again this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, certainly in the past uh, couple of weeks, the idea of storms and even the personality of storms as they're given names like Irma or like Sandy or Jose or other names perhaps that might strike a chord with you as you have had families in their path, Storms that come along and uh, invariably, I don't know if you have ever uh, fielded this question, but in storms like that or in trials or when things aren't going well or when uh, seemingly injustice is done, when hurt is suffered, oftentimes there's the question, I have received the question many times, if he is such a loving God, why did he allow this? Right? There's, there's a, a, a critical, judgmental addressing of your God and accusing him. And so perhaps you've had an answer. Perhaps you sat there for a moment going, well, what do I say? Well, you know, it's not just the uh, unbelievers or those who are critical of God that have asked that question through time. We're going to read a passage or study a passage this morning that Jesus' very own disciples are asking that question. 
As we've just read in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, you could perhaps think of it or break it down into two sections for the purposes of our understanding this morning. The first part is considering the challenges that the storm has to our faith. Or perhaps you might rather think of it this way, more realistically, how does the storm reveal what our faith is? For rarely is it a case where in the tough circumstances of life that our faith falters, perhaps our faith was already a little too much on the wrong thing. And the circumstance of the storm just revealed that to us. But we see in the first uh, verses 35 through 38, the challenge that the storm faces to our faith or the, the revelation of what our faith is really like in the midst of the storm. And then the latter part of the passage We are reintroduced to the Lord over the storm. The Lord over the storm. And in those two sections, we have two different questions that are posed. One in the midst of the storm by the disciples that asks, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Now this account is found in three different Gospels, and the three Gospels record different aspects of what uh, the apostles addressed to the Lord. And this one in particular, Mark, as he's writing to a predominantly Roman audience, and he's just connecting to a group of people who are more used to action. They don't want a lot of words. That resonates. Who is this? Who are you that you don't care that we're perishing? And then as we consider the Lord over the storm in the second part of the passage, we are faced with asking the right questions. As the uh, disciples are left with, who is this? And so let's consider a few things, shall we? Looking at the first part of this account. And being reminded that this is a true account, this is not some fable that we can learn a good, valuable lesson from. This is actual history. This is actual history. This took place, and God doesn't lie. He doesn't exaggerate. This is the way it happened. We read in verse 35. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. What are the things that we can encounter that we find in this passage that perhaps were elements that challenged their faith? First, we could understand that as Mark makes it clear in the first verse, on that day when evening had come. Well, what day is that? He refers back to the beginning of chapter 4 when he begins teaching by the seaside. And crowds are inundating. He's forced to go and stand in a boat because there's so many people. There's a certain level or a certain uh, assumption of exhaustion that takes place as he, after a long day of teaching, it says that when evening had come, the Lord said, let's go to the other side. It's interacting with large crowds that can be tiring. I don't know how many of you get tired just thinking about going to the fair. You know, some of you, you're energized by it, but crowds can be exhausting. Teaching all day can be exhausting. Listening to teaching all day can be exhausting. Jesus himself, as we find him asleep on the stern, was exhausted being the God-man. Yes, he was God, but he was also fully man and suffered the same kind of exhaustion that we could suffer. And so we find that there was perhaps a certain element or level of exhaustion with the disciples as well. But also, not only is there a situation of possible exhaustion, but also there is a certain unexpected unexpectation or a, a sense in which the apostles or disciples expected one thing and something else took place. For we read, Jesus said to them, Jesus initiates, he says, let's go to the other side. Well, what's on the other side and what's the assumption there? Well, Jesus first initiates this, and usually the other side is the other side of the lake where there were not as many people, there were not a large number of population living, and so there was a certain expectation probably of rest and getting away from the thick of ministry so that they could rest and relax and regroup and and reset. That happens in chapter 6. 
we find that very same thing taking place. They go to the other side to draw away from the pressure. And so Jesus here, he initiates. And that's in the idea we bring up and think about it. You know, how many of you love it when your plans are altered for you? How many of you love it when things do not go according to your plan, do not go according to your expectations? For some of you, that really bothers you, that really sets you off, right? Well, here possibly, very likely, after a long, tiring day, right, the disciples are thinking, hey, all right, now we're going to go relax, we're going to get some quiet time with the Lord, this is going to be great. The disciples anticipated a reprieve. They were sailing to a place where the crowds were sparse. And I wrote here, Jesus knows of every circumstance that will arise in our lives. You know, even if our plans or our expectations has, have not conceived of it. And Jesus has, by allowing us to go through those plans, let us know that he has the grace not only to have us get through it, but have us to be glorifying him in place of it. We also read in this account that they took him along in the boat as he was, as he was already there standing. So there's no preparation. There's no getting things ready. And it says that there are other little boats with them. Very likely they were in a small boat themselves. And so we have a certain level of exhaustion starting to take place, right? Brewing in this circumstance, we have uh, a level of um, um, unexpectation or uh, expectations not met. But then we see as the disciples encounter a storm that in their perception at that time was more powerful than God's presence. Let's read on. It says in verse 37, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. And we read later on that the disciples, some of them seasoned fishermen, familiar with this area, familiar with these kinds of storms, are scared of death. They believe that death is imminent with this situation. Now, this is not too uncommon with this geography. As the Sea of Galilee had a certain geography around it, that likely this is taking place in wintertime when there was the worst time for winds. The, 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 the area around the Sea of Galilee was conducive to sudden uh, wind currents coming in. The Sea of Galilee itself was almost 700 feet below sea level. The, ra the hills around were over 2,000 feet. And so that all equaled where the, 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 there were these sudden, unexpected storms that would arise. These guys knew this. These guys had experienced these storms. But what was it about this one that was extra powerful? You know, I re remember uh, hearing some accounts of those who would say, I'm going to sit through Irma and I'm going I'm to ride it out. You know, I've rode out other hurricanes before and then others saying, don't do it because this one's not like the other ones you've experienced. Right? And so here we have a situation in which the disciples are faced with something that they know they can't control. They're not used to. And they're going to die because of it. All that culminating in their perspective on this circumstance. The circumstance was more powerful than the God that was in the boat with them. Mark describes it as a great windstorm. Matthew describes it as a suddenly a great tempest arose. And the word he used, the Greek word there is seismos mega. You know, you know, seismic activity, seismos mega, a mega storm. And it says that the boat was already covered. Luke says, and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. This is not, we're talking about a few little waves lapping over, you know, and okay, let's get the little pans out and bail. There's a certain expectation of death. It was sudden, it was powerful, it was destructive. It was something that even seasoned fishermen couldn't handle. When we read on in verse 38, it says, but, it but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, now I was sitting there was thinking about that. Now on the one hand, Jesus is sleeping because he is exhausted. Like I said, he is fully man. But also being fully God, 
He sovereignly knew that they were going to be coming into this storm. And for, perhaps he caused this storm to be as large as it was. He had full understanding that they were going from a long, exhaustive day of teaching into a more exhausting, frightening storm. God is like that with us sometimes, isn't he? We're expecting things to get more comfortable. We're expecting things to get better, to get nicer. And we interpret that with, that's what a loving God would do. We interpret that as, that's how things are going to go right. But then things get worse. Right, So we start wondering, what have I done wrong? Or what's God doing wrong? We start questioning God. Well, here, God himself is asleep. It says he's asleep on the cushion, and then they awoke him and said to him. It's the idea that he's not sovereign enough to deal with this while he's asleep. Remember, their perspective on who Jesus is has everything to do with what their faith is like. He's not acting as we would expect him to. If he loved us, if he was caring for us, he'd be awake and dealing with this threat. So there's this implication that they need to wake him up. They need to help God understand, hey, God, uh, hello, you need to do something about this. Because we interpret it as this is what needs to be done. Have you ever done that? You ever tried to tell God what he needs to do in your life? I have, or maybe you haven't voiced it. You haven't had the guts, but yeah, yeah. You're kind of acting like it, like, uh, okay, God. You know, we try to wake God out of his sleep. God, uh, how come you're not doing what I want you to do? How come you're not returning me back to my comfortable and peaceful circumstances where I want to be? You know, um, this is not the only time that the disciples felt this uh, urge to try and instruct Jesus. We have perhaps one of the most famous with Peter himself, right? In Mark chapter 8, verse 32, where Peter, and he's, he, Peter right, tries to tell Jesus, no, you're not going to do this. And so in Mark 8, 32, and he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And that's our problem many times. We interpret that God should act in a way that we believe, but we are thinking man-centered. We are thinking comfortable life-centered. But Jesus has something more important in mind. Jesus has a greater agenda. He cares more about our faith in the midst of tough circumstances than our comfort. And he's willing to allow us to go through uncomfortable circumstances, even perhaps devastating ones, because he desires that our faith be strengthened. We start asking the wrong questions, as we talked about before. They say here, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing in verse 38? Think about that. These are the disciples that have been with Christ they had seen him. It's not like they've just been introduced to who he is. They've seen his power. They've heard his authoritative words. And they themselves, of all people on the face of the earth, who should be able to have the faith and the perception to trust in him, it's them. But what do they accuse him of here? First, of not caring or loving them. And not taking care of them, not being powerful enough. They're driven by fear. They perceive their lack of safety as a breakdown in God's sovereignty, and their faith falters. Or perhaps their faith was more resting on a comfortable life even before, it's just now being revealed. When you fear your circumstances more than God's sovereign power, you will falter in your faith. A great example of faith in the midst of tough circumstances is the book of Daniel. Right? With Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, we read in verses 17 and 18. Right? They're about to, uh, to suffer. And they say, If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. O king. 
But if not, verse 18 says in Daniel 3, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You know what they're saying? They're saying our God is powerful enough to get us out of this situation. But if he doesn't get us out of this situation, nothing changes. We're still not going to worship you. They didn't have the confidence that God was going to avoid their pain. They had the confidence that God knew what he was doing if God allowed them pain in the fiery furnace. In other words, they had faith in God. They had a trust in him that even carried them through possible torture. These are just normal guys. By the way, these are teenagers. These are not super Christians. They just had an implicit full trust in God. So the disciples here, Lord, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? They're asking the wrong questions. They're asking the wrong questions. They're more concerned about their circumstance and their comfort and their care than they are God's glory what God is doing. They don't understand that the faith would help them to see that a loving God is allowing them to go through these circumstances for his sovereign reasons that they may not know or ever know. You know, circumstances, tough circumstances, we've heard it before, trials allow us to grow, right? You know how they purify gold, right? You have to heat it up, don't you? They would heat up the gold, right? And they would allow the dross to come to the surface and they would scoop it away. And you know how they would tell if the gold was pure enough? As they would keep reheating it and re-scooping as they would look in and see if they could see the reflection in the molten gold. God heats us up in our lives. God heats up our circumstances because he wants to see himself through our lives. Jesus did not come to give us a peaceful and wealthy and prosperous life now. Joel Olstein is wrong. He came to give us eternal life. He came to reveal himself for who he is and said, I loved you enough to do this and to bring you into eternity with myself instead of separated. Even John says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Well, let's finish up this time by looking at the Lord over the storm. Up till now, the disciples are asking the wrong questions. They're perceiving their circumstances to be much more powerful than the God that is walking through them with them. They're believing that God is asleep, that God's not acting right. And let's look at verses 39 and 40 through 41. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now just picture that for a minute. I don't know if you saw any TV images of what was going on with Hurricane Irma, but you can see the sea, right, and how it's being churned up. And um, if that wind were to suddenly cease, which would be a miracle in and of itself, what would happen to the water? It's going to keep going for a while, right? I remember uh, my grandmother, um, I'm not going to say this was a long time ago, because for some of you I'm a spring chicken, but uh, uh, my grandmother had a doughboy pool, right? And as little kids, we loved to go over to grandma's house, not only because she would feed us a bunch of stuff that we loved to eat, but uh, we could also swim in her pool. And so we would get these tubes, right? I'm the youngest of six kids, and so we'd have six kids in there. And we'd get these tubes, and we would, our favorite thing would just start bobbing up and down with these tubes. And we'd get these waves going in the doughboy pool. You know, the walls are kind of pulsating in and out. My grandmother would come out, or my grandfather, you know, knock that off. <laughs> they were afraid of the thing just disintegrating. So we would suddenly stop, right? Because when Grandpa spoke, you didn't do anything. And so Grandpa said, stop. So we'd stop, but we'd still just get tossed around in the waves, you know, and, and over time, wait for them to subside. It took time 
Imagine a whole large sea for, for their intensive purposes an ocean. Not only is the wind powerful enough to churn up these massive waves, but you have the waves. And Jesus speaks first to the wind. That makes sense. The wind is what is causing the waves. And then he speaks to the ocean. And there is sudden calm and sudden peace. He is the Lord over the storm. It is only God that can speak to an inanimate, unseen, non-corporeal element such as the wind and have it respond instantly exactly the way he says it. This is God's sovereign omnipotence. Psalm 107 verses 24 and 25 said this, They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. Many times in Scripture, we see of God's power and ability to control the elements and literally speak them into existence and to control them. And here, he calms them. He rebukes the wind, it stops. He calms the seas, and they're still. Like glass. Then, he confronts their lack of faith. He says in verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? This is indicating that there was a fear due to a lack of faith. Understand the disciples are like us. You know, they've been with Jesus day in and day out. They witness again his authority and his power, and yet they're still prone to fear and to anxiety that consumes them, that preoccupates them, preoccupies them. Whether there be circumstances that are out of our control or relationship issues, they are inundated and consumed with them and they lose sight of who God is. They lose sight of the God, the powerful God that is walking through them, with them in the midst of the storm. They're fearing the wrong things. And when you get to a point to where you fear the circumstances more than the God who is over the circumstances. But what's interesting is we see their fear change at the end of the passage. We see in verse 41, and they were filled with what? Not just fear, great fear. There's only one thing more scary of the storm that is coming in the boat, and that is having God Almighty already in the boat. And they realize this, and they ask now, they're starting to ask the right questions. What do they ask? Verse 41, who then is this? They have just gotten another reality dose of who God is, of who their Lord is, of who it is that is walking with them in the midst of the storm. Who is this? And a sense of awe and a sense of majesty and a sense of fear of tremendous. Who is this? And I'll tell you, if you can be brought to a place where in the midst of a tough circumstance or a trial, even where you're fearing for your life or the safety perhaps of one who's close to you, in the horrible grips of cancer or a, a hurricane. If you can come to the place where you say, who is this that walks with me, that loves me, that gave his life for me, and that has the ability, the omnipotence to do whatever he deems fit to do. Who is this? When you start contemplating the nature of who God is, of who Jesus is, and allowing your heart and mind to be filled with the wonder of who he is, then you are well on your way of putting yourself, being put back to a right place of faith and trust and right perspective. And your circumstances may not change at all, but your perception of those circumstances, your understanding of God's purpose for those circumstances can completely and radically change your heart, your faith, and your life. One of the greatest weapons against fear is the preoccupation of God, the preoccupation really of three things relating to God. And may I remind you in Matthew 10, 28, he himself exhorted, he says, do not fear 
Those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Three things that can greatly uh, help us to not be fearing in the face of storms. Number one, it's God's character. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Not setting your heart and your mind upon the circumstances, but upon the God who is over the circumstances and who is walking with you through those circumstances. Number two, it is being resolute and reminded in God's love for you. How is it that you could trust him to love you, to save you from certain eternal damnation, but you can't trust him to do the right thing with your life in the midst of the circumstance? Trust that God loves you. Isn't it Matthew 6, uh, an extensive passage on challenging our anxiety? He says, do not be anxious. Know that God loves you and he cares for you more than the birds of the air. But also God's plan in eternity. Right? Colossians 3 does not exhort us to, uh, to be having our minds and our hearts set on eternity and the things to come. You will never fear to lose what you don't value. Or you could say it this way, you will fear to lose what you value most. And if it is your life here on earth or if it is your possessions here on earth or whatever it is here on earth, if you fear to lose temporal things more than eternal things, then that's where your faith will be placed. So, are you asking the right questions? Are you asking the right questions? Who is this that is my Savior? Who it is this that has gave his precious life for me? Who is this that loves me greater than anyone on this earth could possibly fathom? And not only has the power to do what he needs to do, but has the foresight and exactly knows what he wants to do with my life. Let's end with just being reminded of a few things that we saw of who God is in this passage. First, he's the God of the universe. He is the omnipotent God of the universe that can manipulate, that can cease raging elements. He is also your Savior. He is a relational, a personal God. He loves you to the point of death. He cared about the disciples. That is why he rebuked them. He is also the God who is over your circumstances. And he is the God who is walking with you through your circumstances. And he is the God who loves you enough to not remove you from your circumstances until he has taught you what he wanted you to learn. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, this life is about continuously being reminded and learning in a new way. Just who you are. What a glorious God you are. What a great love that you have for us as so beautifully put in Romans chapter 8. Lord, we thank you for not removing us from our circumstances before we have learned. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to even discipline us in the midst of our circumstances. You are gracious, glorious, mighty God. And Lord, we pray this morning for all of us here this morning that, Lord, this would just be the the priming of the pump, if you will, to us being renewed in our desire to be reminded of who you are, to be preoccupied with your glorious name, with your glorious character, with this wonderful relationship, Lord, that you initiated as you pulled us out of the mire, as you took us as worthless, worthless, 
individuals and made us into precious jewels. The apple of your eye. O oh Lord, may we even be asking the question in the midst of the storm not to have you stop it, but to have you reveal yourself in the middle of it. That we might be that much more equipped for the next storm or be able to walk with someone else to help them to understand who you are. Lord, help us to have our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We thank you so much for loving us enough to save us and bring us into an eternal relationship with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.